the interior of alaska is one of the wildest regions left on earth it is a wilderness of mountain peaks and flowing glaciers vast tundra and spruce forest it is a land ruled by the forces of wind and ice in the heart of the alaska range lies a national park whose boundaries have been shaped by the creatures that embody this wilderness. Wolves, grizzly and caribou wander freely, their lives an expression of their own ancient laws. Sunlight revives the slumbering pulse of life after eight months of winter. In the lengthening hours of light and warmth, summer returns to the subarctic. The young of the year were born when the first green plants began to emerge. Growth is intense with less than four months to develop and prepare for yet another winter. This is the common law that guides all forms of life here. For the young of the Denali caribou herd, growth takes on a special urgency. Carried unborn from the herd's wintering grounds just a few weeks ago, they must already join the return migration. The calves must keep up with the others across high mountains and swift rivers and outrun the predators they will encounter. The moose calf spends the first few months of its life within the sheltered environment of the spruce forest. The moose cow will ferociously defend her young against any threat. Wolves and grizzlies, however, still manage to take their toll. Between the time of birth and early winter, the calf will gain nearly 400 pounds. The habitat for most plant eaters of the subarctic has been narrowed to the range of the specific plants they thrive on. Predators tend to be wide-ranging in their search for food. In a land where prey is rarely abundant, the red fox may need to hunt in many habitats in order to feed its young. By autumn, the pups will be ready to venture out from the den and face the coming winter on their own. After a month of almost continuous daylight, the summer's green has spread from the river lowlands to the high alpine tundra. Most of the plant life in this land above treeline grows in a shallow carpet. It is but a thin veneer of life over cold, barren soil and rock. The doll sheep inhabit this sparse, windswept realm because the available cliffs offer a refuge from predators.
The ewes and their young remain separate from the rams during the summer in nursery groups. Through the abandon of play, the lambs quickly develop their skills of escape and begin to compete with each other. Grizzly spends much of its summer in the alpine tundra feeding on grasses, herbs, and an occasional ground squirrel. The moose and caribou calves that the grizzly pursued in early summer can easily outrun it now. The business of life continues into the ebbing summer night, while food and warmth are still plentiful. Time, like the restless caribou herd, moves on. Despite its vast size and seeming lushness, this land cannot support the teeming animal populations that areas like East Africa are so well known for. Concentrations of animals like the caribou must move over large expanses of tundra to find adequate food. The compelling drive behind the caribou's yearly migration, however, involves more than the search for food. Changing from season to season, year to year, the herd's movements are influenced by a myriad of forces. No longer able to keep up with the herd's rigorous journey, the weak and injured will inevitably fall behind. The relationship between a caribou and its predators is one that has worked for thousands of years. Man's presence in this wilderness park is a light touch of what could be a heavy hand. As long as this touch remains light, these natural relationships will continue. Thank you. 
Since early spring, the doll sheep rams have been in bachelor groups, wandering over the high ridge tops of their summer range. It is here that the young rams develop their skills of combat, and in the presence of older rams, learn their place in a dominance hierarchy based on the size of their elegant horns and the strength they possess in using them. The display of these horns is a common language among all rams, a way to immediately convey one's rank. Because of this, most fights occur only when rams of equal horn size question each other's potential. For the sheep, getting along is a means of saving energy. The pika spends its summer in the boulder fields of the sheep's habitat, collecting grasses and flowers into hay piles within the rocks. This is a full-time project and will provide the pika with a steady food supply beneath the winter snow. The marmot has just begun to collect grasses, but these will be used to line its den for hibernation. Though the landscape is still green, the marmot knows that winter is not far away. After months of almost continuous feeding, the Alaskan bull moose is in his prime. By now, the bull has stored a thick layer of fat and has grown a set of antlers nearly six feet wide. During growth, these antlers are nourished by a mantle of velvet, a soft covering of skin and blood vessels. In time, this velvet is shed to reveal a formidable sculpture of bone. The rules and rewards for the hierarchies of sheep and moose are basically the same. The bigger the rack, the more dominant the rank the more likely one is to breed. But the antlers of moose are more than symbols of rank. They are deadly weapons. Before the breeding season, or rut, the bulls develop a hierarchy with others in the area through light sparring matches. These matches rarely get violent, for if either bull was to make the first strike, his opponent could still cause him severe damage, and both would be losers in the game of breeding, and survival. For the moose, fighting has evolved to be the final and most serious means for settling questions of dominance. The days grow shorter and the nights are crisp and dark. Summer draws to a close. Autumn is the bright flame of a summer's energy, glowing for a moment of celebration before the approaching wind of winter. It is a time of movement and migration, and it is a time of purposeful play. A young golden eagle will now test its skills of flight on anything that seems challenging. Grizzly and the Arctic ground squirrel perform the final movements in their dance of predator and prey, 
soon they will both be in the long sleep of winter. The season of warmth and growth has been brief, but as always, life is prepared for what lies ahead. It is early October. The Denali caribou herd pauses briefly from its incessant movement as the season for breeding unfolds. Food now lies beneath a deep blanket of snow, but the caribou's hooves are designed to easily reach it. The wolf is also well equipped to reach its winter food supply. Armed with keen senses and incredible endurance, it is a finely tuned hunter. In the company of other wolves, it is the supreme predator of the north. The pack is the central core of the wolf's life and in winter becomes an essential means of capturing large, swift prey like the caribou. Sometimes the prey is simply run down, but this time the strategy of ambush comes into play. The balance between escape and death is a dynamic one, and more times than not, the caribou will escape. Soon the herd will migrate outside of this pack's territory and the wolves will shift their attention to other prey. Predation is a sculpting tool in evolution's continuing art of adaptation. Both the snowshoe hare and the willow ptarmigan lose their summer color to remain hidden from the winter creatures that hunt them. The rut of the Alaskan moose draws to a close. The seed for next year's young has been planted. And now the task facing the moose is to survive the next six months of severe cold and deep snows within the domain of the wolf. 
During the several weeks of intense rutting, the bulls have eaten very little, depleting much of the energy stored from a summer of foraging. Some have been killed or injured in battles to gain or defend harems. The wolves are familiar with the time and location of the moose rut and are rarely disappointed when they arrive in search of food. The wolves and the moose share a relationship of mutual need for it is the wolves' presence which ensures that only the fittest bulls will survive to breed and continue their genetic line. In the reality nurtured by our mechanized world, death seems to be a meaningless end. Here in the Denali wilderness, the meaning of death is the continuation of life. The Denali caribou herd makes the final thrust of the journey to their wintering grounds. Perhaps the caribou sense a change of temperature, the depth of a new fallen snow, or the sun's shallow arc above the Alaska range. The reasons are as mysterious as the passage they will make on next year's migration. As the Indians say, no one knows the ways of the wind or the caribou. The conflict for dominance is not a struggle for survival of the individual, but rather a foothold on the future. That this foothold exists is the symbol of true wilderness. That this wilderness is preserved is the hallmark of civilization. 